Welcome to Lesson 4 for the topic Ideas to Implementation. In this lesson we will cover Hertz's experiment to emit and detect radio waves as well as his discovery of the photoelectric effect. In Year 11 and in the previous topic Motors and Generators we have discussed electromagnetism. We have noted that there are four equations called Maxwell's equations which describe how charges make fields. The first describes the fact that an isolated charge will produce an electric field with divergence, that is a field that emerges from positive charges or ends on negative charges. The second equation describes the fact that it is not possible to make a magnetic field with divergence. The third equation describes how changing magnetic fields create an electric field with curl, that is which points in a circle. You have encountered this as Faraday's law. The final equation describes how there are two ways to make a magnetic field with curl. It can be made with moving charges. You know this as the right hand grip rule for the magnetic field around a current carrying wire. A magnetic field with curl can also be made by a changing electric field. In this way there is a symmetry between how a changing magnetic field creates an electric field and a changing electric field creates a magnetic field. As scientists including James Clerk Maxwell, Oliver Heaviside, Oliver Lodge and George Fitzgerald continued to work on electromagnetism between the mid and late 1800s, it was realised that these equations predicted that accelerating charges, that is ones which are creating a changing electric and magnetic field, will produce a wave consisting of oscillations in the electric and magnetic fields. Not only did the equations predict the existence of such a wave, they also predicted its speed. This number was found to match that previously measured for visible light. This was a very exciting development. Visible light is an electromagnetic wave, that is an oscillation in electric and magnetic fields. As it was expected that electromagnetic waves could have a range of wavelengths, the race was on for experimentalists to produce an electromagnetic wave other than visible light. In 1888, Heinrich Hertz was the first to successfully produce and detect radio waves which are electromagnetic waves with a wavelength of several tens of centimetres or longer. To produce radio waves, Hertz used a primary circuit consisting of a spark gap excited by a high voltage from a Rumkoff coil. Shown here is Hertz's own sketch of his experimental setup along with a simplified line diagram that is suitable for HSC answers. As the sparking across the gap in the primary conductor consists of a flow of charge oscillating rapidly in direction. Electromagnetic waves are generated at the spark gap with a frequency which was determined by the design of the circuit, that is its inductance and capacitance. Hertz estimated this frequency to be 100 million cycles per second, or in modern terminology 100 megahertz. The secondary conductor used in this particular experiment was a circle of wire of radius 35 centimetres with a tiny gap whose width was adjustable with a micrometer. To demonstrate reflection of radio waves and to measure their wavelength, Hertz set up a zinc screen 4 metres high and 2 metres broad at one end of the large lecture hall in which he was performing his experiments. He set up the primary conductor 13 metres away. In this situation a standing wave was produced in front of the zinc screen. Hertz could detect the nodes of his standing wave by comparing the sparking produced across the secondary conductor as he moved away from the screen. The distance between two antinodes, where the sparking was greatest, is equal to half a wavelength. Knowing the wavelength and knowing the frequency of the waves, Hertz could confirm that their velocity was that of visible light and that the waves he was producing were in fact the electromagnetic waves predicted by Maxwell's equations. In a further experiment reported in December 1888, Hertz demonstrated that all the properties of light and other types of waves such as reflection, refraction, interference, diffraction and polarization could also be observed in radio waves. For this experiment he modified his equipment somewhat he increased the frequency of the oscillations by a factor of 10 so that the wavelength of the radio waves was about 30 centimetres and was small enough that he could construct parabolic mirrors to reflect the waves and so generate parallel beams. His primary conductor for this experiment is shown on the left 
in top-down view. This was placed at the focus of a parabolic mirror shown on the right, constructed from zinc sheets and supported on a wooden framework. The secondary conductor he used for these experiments is shown in the centre. Hertz established that the beam of radio waves he produced with his mirror travelled in straight lines and could be blocked by conductors such as metal sheets, but not by insulators such as wooden doors. Diffraction of the beam was established by the fact there were no sharp geometrical limit to the shadows formed by objects opaque to the beam. By constructing a frame with parallel copper wires stretched on it, Hertz was able to demonstrate that the radio waves he was producing were polarised. When he allowed the beam to pass through the wires arranged vertically, which was the same direction as the electric field in his waves, there were no sparks observed at the secondary conductor. When the wires were parallel, the beam passed through them and was detected by the secondary. Hertz established using plain mirrors of metal that the beam of radio waves obeyed the law of reflection. And finally, by constructing a triangular prism from pitch, Hertz could demonstrate that the radio waves were refracted. As the spark gap in the secondary coil was only hundredths of a millimetre wide, early on in his researches, Hertz tried putting it in a dark box so as to more easily see the spark. He noticed that the maximum length of the secondary spark was much less when it was in the box. He established that it was only the part of the box directly between the primary and secondary sparks that caused the effect. He found that the reduction in the maximum length of the spark occurred for a range of materials, including glass, paraffin and metals, but not quartz. He noted that a phenomenon so remarkable called for closer investigation. Hertz then proceeded to perform many careful investigations. Using a prism of quartz, he could establish that it was the ultraviolet part of the spectrum of electromagnetic waves emitted by the primary spark, which was responsible for the effect on the secondary spark. Hertz finishes his report by stating, I confine myself at present to communicating the results obtained without attempting any theory respecting the manner in which the observed phenomena are brought about. Indeed, the photoelectric effect, as it came to be known, requires a quantum mechanical explanation, as we shall see in the next two lessons. In class, we will perform an experiment to produce radio waves with an induction coil. Rather than use the kind of secondary that Hertz used, we will detect our radio waves with radio. We can see that the radio waves are being produced by the induction coil as the static picked up by the radio increases when the induction coil is switched on and decreases when it is switched off. We note that the electromagnetic radiation is produced by the spark gap with a wide range of frequencies. We can see the visible light and we can detect static across a wide range of frequencies with the radio. That's it for lesson four. I'll look forward to seeing you all in class.